We think we know what gothic music sounds like. We hear it in the soundtrack of films like Psycho. In the accompaniment to silent films. We know it from goth subculture. We know what goth music is supposed to do. It's supposed to make us feel agitated. Or unsettled. or just plain creeped out. <laughs> Gothic music might be played on overpowering organs or terrifying music boxes or sung by disturbed and disturbing voices. Its primary function is affect. It's supposed to make us feel those emotions associated with the Gothic to create feelings of fear, suspense, alarm, unease, to tap into our sense of the uncanny, to startle us out of our senses. But has the music of Gothic always functioned in this way? Was there a time when the music of Gothic wasn't frightening? If so, what did it sound like? And when did the conventions of our kind of Gothic music become established? These are the, some of the questions that I'm going to be addressing this evening with the help of Seb Gillett, who has arranged much of what you'll hear this evening, and this marvellous group of musicians he has assembled especially for this recital. We're going to be thinking about the period 1789 to 1820, a time when ideas about music in the Gothic and what it was supposed to do changed. You're going to be hearing the music of Gothic plays, of early Gothic melodramas and operatic romances, and a Gothic song. And we'll be thinking about the relation between this music and Gothic literature more generally. So we're going to start with a song composed in 1702, which is some years before the period we're actually looking at. It's a song that was written for Shakespeare's Macbeth. And strange though it might seem to us, for over 170 years, Macbeth was a musical play with loads of singing and dancing. The Macbeths, Duncan, Banquo, they didn't sing. They didn't dance either. <laughs> All the music was associated with the witches. And this is the sprightly number they dance to on the heath. Macbeth 
is not a Gothic play, of course, though it's frequently referenced in Gothic novels. Leverage's music, however, is of interest to us because it's associated with the supernatural and it's frequently performed in the period we're looking at. And it's also something we've got some informative reactions on record for. According to his school friend Amos, the preteen Percy Bysshe Shelley would run nimbly up and down the stairs with buoyant cheerfulness in their house at Eton, singing the witches' songs in Macbeth. In the 1820s, Samuel Palmer and fellow artists could be heard at night time in the hollow clefts and deserted chalk pits round Shoreham in Kent, singing the Macbeth music. Evidently, this music was enlivening and fun. For Romantic period audiences, it was refreshingly ancient sounding. For Shelley, who was hideously bullied at Eton, it probably provided a sense of release and maybe vicarious feelings of revenge. The Macbeth music sounded countercultural. It sang the joys of the outside world, of amorality, of rebellion. And hearing it today can remind us that though music might be associated with the horrid, it doesn't need to make the flesh crawl. And though the works featured tonight are stowed away in archives now, they were the popular music of their day. They were applauded in playhouses, they were printed for home performance, for singing around the piano or the harp with family and friends, for private concerts, private theatricals. This music could be heard in the streets, in schools, in deserted chalk pits. Our next piece is a chorus for nuns, arranged for two voices. It was composed by Samuel Arnold, Arnold sorry, for James Bowden's play, The Italian Monk, performed at the Theatre Royal Haymarket in 1797. And look out for my favourite line, visions of rapture subliming her rest. Evidently, these are no evil nuns chanting diabolically. They're singing of calm and peace, peacefully and calmly. Though the music surges, it ends with that gently falling line and the image of the wing of the seraph who fluttered away. The Italian Monk was an adaptation of Anne Radcliffe's novel, The Italian. And in the novel, as in the play, music offers a welcome rest from Gothic tension. The heroine, under pressure from an unscrupulous abbess to take the veil, only has to reach the convent's music room to experience pure and uplifting emotion. As Radcliffe writes, the performance immediately opened with one of those solemn and impressive airs which the Italian nuns know how to give with so much taste and sweetness. It rescued even Elena for a moment from a sense of danger. In Radcliffe's novels, music most often to adapt some lines from Browning means intensely, and it means good. Gothic novels of the Romantic period tend to be full of music, or rather, they are after 1789. If we look at 
In Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto of 1764, there's barely a reference to music. Fast forward 25 years and the novels of Anne Radcliffe, Matthew Lewis, Eleanor Sleeth, they're full of it. In Radcliffe, heroes serenade, landscapes are suffused by music, heroines play their lutes and sing with a simplicity and pathos that makes their performances enchanting. The ease with which her novels were adapted as pieces of musical theatre suggests to me that opera was integral to their conception. Her works are, after all, full of peasant girls performing merry dances, singing sailors, choruses of vine dresses, gondoliers and bandits. And for us, as 21st century readers, it's easy to ignore these details. But 18th century readers would have clocked the reference and they would have mentally heard certain kinds of performance. They would have been alive to the fact that, for example, when music on the water is played, it frequently comes with horn accompaniment. And this was the case for the next number that we're going to play. And it's William Shields' music for the Sicilian Mariners in Miles Peter Andrews' Mysteries of the Castle, produced at Covent Garden in 1795. The vocal school notes it was originally accompanied by horns and clarinets, but look to the oboe for the horn part in this arrangement. It's a sunny number with a rolling and easy rhythm, and the only shade cast is in those few bars in the relative minor when the sailors warn us to beware of Charybdis, the whirlpool. By virtuous characters. Villains usually don't get to sing in Gothic novels or plays of this period. Significantly, when the singing sailors arrive to carry off the young women, they are quickly persuaded to desist and end up siding with the goodies. Mysteries of the Castle and the Italian Monk were not particularly faithful adaptations of Radcliffe's novels. Andrews and Bowden had other imperatives. They were more interested in making the content work within the pre-existing template of the very popular comic operas of the playhouses. And these comic operas typically contain numbers for lecherous but impotent old men, or gossipy women, or servant class gluttons and skivers, kinds of characters you tend not to get that much of in Gothic novels. The inclusion of such characters, I think, is one of the reasons why people reading 18th century Gothic drama today frequently find the tone confusing. So we've got here the first verse of a comic poacher number from Mysteries of the Castle. Encoaching all mankind delight 
Fate and early rising till the end is he by tail and tries to withdraw one another in poetry all mankind's delight. Fate and early rising till the end is he by tail and tries to withdraw one another. Friends to chop the will will try he tips a wink and cocks the eye and while he looks so well he shy may escape me more of his brother. Smoke the joke, what fool so dull? Always grinning, loud and chilling. Let us quiz his ugly face, giggling while he's grinning. Friends to trap the will will try. He tips the wink and cocks the eye, and while he looks so wild, he stop may gain me more of his brother. Smoke the joke, what fool the dull? Always grinning, loud and chilling. Let us quiz his ugly face, giggling while he's grinning. of that default mode comic opera that when George Coleman turned his hand to adapting that classic of paranoid gothic William Godwin's Caleb Williams he populated his adaptation The Iron Chest with noble bandits cheeky servant class heroines wily poachers and lecherous but ultimately worthy old blokes for the music Coleman turned to Stephen Starace or Storis, but I like saying Storace, so I'm going to say Storace. <laughs> Composer of the phenomenally successful The Haunted Tower of 1789. Storace, whose sister Nancy was one of the leading sopranos of the age, had worked and trained on the continent, and he provided a score that was more akin to continental than English opera. As well as the obligatory bandits drinking song, full of references to liberty and the joys of wine, Storace produced his other stalwart of the tradition, a listen, what can you hear number, sung by Judith, the bandit's mole, and two of her fellow outlaws. So listen to the interplay between the vocal parts, full of pauses and tight rhythmic coordination, tied to the fairly slow underlying tempo, as in relation to that fast-moving accompaniment suggestive of a greater urgency. Listen to for the fluttery motif for the owl in the flute, the sudden diminished seventh chord when the owl hoots, and the word painting on the word mouldering. <laughs> Thank you. 
during the rehearsals for The Iron Chest, the 33-year-old Starace was dead within a week of its opening in 1796. Had he lived longer, the development of The Sound of the Gothic might have been different. The baton passed to his friend, Michael Kelly. Kelly, the acclaimed Irish tenor, had been friends with the Staraces since they were all in their teens. They'd met in Italy, where Kelly had been sent to study music after a highly successful a slightly unexpected stage debut in Dublin. After performing in opera houses throughout Italy, Kelly followed Nancy Storace to the Burgtheater in Vienna. Here, he hobnobbed with the great and the good, and he partied hard. Like Nancy, he was in the first production of his good friend Mozart's opera, Magic of Fig Marriage of Figaro. In 1787, aged 24, Kelly took London by storm, becoming principal tenor at Drury Lane, as well as singing at Covent Garden and the King's Theatre. So it's no surprise that Matthew Lewis, the celebrated, notorious author of The Monk, turned to Kelly in 1798 for his new play, maybe not that new, but it was definitely the first time it was coming out, The Castle Spectre. By this point, Kelly had become house composer at Drury Lane. Lewis and Kelly were very well matched. Lewis was stage struck and highly musical. They were both very sociable creatures and Kelly says he passed many pleasant hours in Lewis's company. The Castle Spectre was massively successful. We're going to play you three pieces from the work. The first one is Megan O O Megan E. Kelly was very proud of the song, despite its rubbish title. He recounts bursting out with it when passing Conwy Castle on the ferry many years later, much to the surprise of the boatman and the fellow passengers. It's a light-hearted, Richard the Lionheart, Blondel-type rescue number, sung by Motley, the fool, and his associates outside the tower where the young hero is imprisoned. The song is meant to alert Percy to their presence and to their escape plan as you'll hear in this, the first of the three verses. Sleep you or wake you, lady bright, sing Megan, oh, oh Megan, now is the fittest time for flight. Sing Megan, oh, oh Megan, know from your tired and father's power Beneath the wind of your tower, a boat now waits to set you free. Sing, Megan, O, oh, O oh, Megan, sing, Megan, O, oh, O oh, Megan, sing, O, oh, sing, Megan, O, oh, O oh, Megan, sing, sing, Megan, O, oh, O oh, Megan. Megan E is a glee, a part song associated with conviviality and commonly understood as deriving from the ancient traditions of British vocal music. Mm. Lewis gives the number some faux medieval words which rather comically put Percy in the position of Fair Emma, the Lady Bright, about to jump into her lover's arms. In the theatre, the song is immediately followed by Percy's daring jump from the tower into the boat waiting below. The Castle Spectre also featured a real ghost, the heroine's mother, Evelina. Heard before she's seen, Evelina is identified by this fragment of tune. short 
and sweet, in a major key, clear and simple, and accompanied originally by a very domestic instrument popular with the ladies in the late 18th century, the guitar, this is no spine-chilling number. Neither, significantly, is the music to which Evelina's ghost finally makes her appearance. So, as house composer for Drury Lane, Kelly's responsible not merely for writing his own numbers, but picking pre-existing music. For Evelina's ghost, he selected by some, some music by the Italian composer, Niccolo Gemelli, and there are accounts of his astounding out effectiveness. Over 25 years later, James Bowden wrote of the captivation of the unearthly music, testifying, I yet bring before me with delight the waving form of Mrs. Powell advancing from the suddenly illuminated chapel and bending over Angela, Mrs. Jordan, in maternal benediction, during which slow and solemn action the band played a few bars of Jamelli's Chacon. Here is that music. most surprising for 21st century listeners is the lack of eeriness of this piece. It's tender, it's full, it's not designed to conjure up unease or suspense. Instead, the supernatural provokes awe, wonder, a sense of the sublime. This piece was later, as Kelly proudly noted, to become popular in churches. Now, if you've ever wondered how you might depict the sounds of departed souls girdling this round earth in a dizzy motion with noise too vast and constant to behold, then look no further. We're going to play you what Kelly wrote for a cue in Coleridge's play, Remorse. Do note, however, that originally it would have been played on a glass harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> in remorse, the hero, Alvar, having survived an attempt by his brother Osorio to have him murdered, returns in disguise as the stranger. Intent on making his brother confess his guilt, he stages a scene in which the supposedly murdered man is to be called from the dead. A mild spell to summon the man and ask God for pity on his soul is cast first. And when the spell doesn't elicit the brother's confession, Alva threatens to summon a blacker charm. We're going to give you, first, the music for the mild spell. You have to wait for the blacker charm for a bit. It was sung by the celebrated Mrs. Bland, with, as Kelly says, all the refreshing purity of her unsophisticated style, and with that chaste expression and tenderness of feeling, which speak at once, as it were, to the heart. Note how the lyrics read like a playlist for a 1790s gothic novel. Midnight breezes, a deep, long, lingering knell, a cadence dying away on the quiet moonlight sea. Note too how in this magical moment, the words of the song become actuality. Bland sings, the boatmen rest their oars and say, miserere domine, and the miserere chorus sounds.
The music has a family resemblance to that for the ghost scene in the Castle Spectre. Both numbers offer a respite from the turmoil, machinations and madness around. Like the Gemelli, this music is played at a moment when everything is brought to a stop. It operates within earlier 18th century conventions of ombre, invoking the sublime by means of its slow, stately dignity. For the characters on stage, the ensuing miserere becomes a moment of communal devotion into which, arguably, the audience is invited. So, where are we now? We've had serenely beautiful music for incantations and ghost appearances, comic songs breaking into gothic drama, harmonizing nuns, banditti singing hush, Sicilian mariners and castle servants singing glees, and witches being energetically tuneful and merry on the heath. When did the style of music that we consider to be Gothic start to dominate? When did people start deciding that the music of Gothic should scare rather than soothe, amuse, or uplift its audiences? To answer these questions, let's backtrack a little. And let's hear Storace's storm music for the haunted castle of 1789, which, by the way, he'd lifted from his earlier opera, Gli Equivoci. Storace's storm music is an example of tempesta, a type with roots that went back over 100 years. He draws expertly on its conventions, agitated style with unexpected chords, exaggerated dynamics, a musical painting of thunder and lightning. Notice the double hairpins as Storace's music rises in volume and dies away again. And you'll hear how the notes in the upper parts rise and fall in pitch in tandem with those changes in volume. Look out for the depictions of blusteriness with those ever-widening intervals at the end. go-to techniques for tempesta music, surprise chords, big dynamic contrast, proliferation of chromatics are fundamental to the melodrama. We tend to define melodrama in terms of subject matter, don't we? We use the term melodramatic as a kind of shorthand for preposterously heightened emotion allied to unlikely sensationalist events. Actually, the word originally applied to form as a term, it's simply derived from the terms melos and drama, or music and drama. In Britain, at the turn of the 19th century, melodrama was the kind of production that was allowed in theatres which didn't have a licence to perform spoken word drama. But as well as in these illegitimate theatres, melodrama was taken up by the legitimate playhouses Drury Lane and Covent Garden, where, in 1802, Thomas Holcroft and Thomas Busby's The Tale of Mystery was performed to rapturous audiences. Now, melodramatic music works in a different way 
to that of the Gothic drama. In the Gothic drama, apart from curtain music and overtures, the music's primarily diegetic. It's produced by characters who are part of the action, and it's heard by them. Melodramatic music is non-diegetic. It isn't supposed to come from within the world of the play. Rather than being heard by the characters on stage, it's heard by the audience. It is instrumental music that's designed, in Busby's words, to elucidate the action and to heighten the passion of the piece. That is, melodramatic music was supposed to point up and accompany what was going on on stage at certain pivotal moments and to wring particular reactions out of its supercharged audiences. So to give you an idea, we are going to play some examples from the tale of mystery. I'm going to read out the cues as they're found in the score. Musicians, not surprisingly, <laughs> are going to play for you the music that accompanies the action. So we're going to start with the music for Enter Fiametta, Alarmed and in a Hurry. Note those jagged dotted rhythms and the rapidly descending notes at the end known in the trade as a hurry. <laughs> Here's the music for Bonomo and Fiametta enter in violent contention with all those uncomfortable, diminished and augmented intervals illustrative of the tussle. <laughs> Melodramatic music didn't all have to be fast and angular. Here's the music for the cue. Bonomo, being about to examine Francesco, commands him to adhere to the truth. It's short, but it packs a punch. Busby throws in a dramatic augmented sixth just before the end to underline the seriousness. And he does what melodramatic writers frequently do. He leaves you hanging with an imperfect cadence to increase the suspense. <laughs> we'll play an entire sequence for you now. So in this passage, Bonomo is questioning Francisco. Francisco's mute. When Francisco refuses to answer questions about his family, Bonomo asks, why? <laughs> Francisco, holding up a written board, replies, it is disgraced. Bono asks, by you? Francisco gesticulates with agitation. Bono asks, who made you dumb? At which Francisco gives signs of horrible recollection. Note the feverish interplay between small and large intervals, the rhythmic insistence juxtaposed with that frenzy, and yet another imperfect cadence at the close. Eventually, Francisco holds up a sign reading, the same who stabbed me among the rocks. The musical accompaniment is one sustained, horror-inducing diminished seventh chord. Name them. Never. Are they rich? Tell me all or quit my house. Then Romaldi is announced, and Francisco starts up struck with alarm. Note that contrary motion at the end. As the bass descends, the upper parts climb, indicative of Francisco's inner confusion. It would be tantalising, wouldn't it, to leave it there, hanging, unresolved? But that's what melodrama frequently does, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so, this approach to music for the Gothic proved highly successful. After all, it could be said to fulfill Gothic's mission statement, to provide sensations of pleasurable fear, to keep audiences and readers in suspense, to surprise them, to make them shudder, to keep them begging for more. 
Matthew Lewis could certainly see the potential of melodramatic music. He quickly established a partnership with Busby, and their monodrama, The Captive, premiered at Kelvin Garden in March 1803. Its sole character was a woman in a cell in a private madhouse. She wavers between assertions of and fears for her sanity. She speaks of the tyrannical husband who imprisoned her prisoned her, the hard-hearted jailer, the children she's missing. At the climax, she describes the demon she sees whirling a serpent in the air before shouting, I'm mad, I'm mad. At this point, her family enters and saves her. <laughs> Ultimately, the piece was too thrilling. Members of the audience went into fits. The play was pulled after its first performance. Busby's music, unfortunately, doesn't seem to have survived. What has survived is the setting of Lewis's lyrics by the composer Harriet Abrams. Abrams the Jailer is an interesting mixture of the old and new approaches to music. It's a song of tenderness, innocence, and turbulence. In form, it's a seemingly simple, strophic song, the likes of which might have appeared in the Gothic drama of the 1790s. Stylistically, however, it's quick-changing and fractured. The speaker's turmoil is captured in the sudden surges and falls in volume. The phrases are short and contrasting. Abrams doesn't go for chromatics, but listen out for that unexpected chord when the heroine is promising her jailer she'll be calm. to say that when the melodrama came along, the old idea of what music and the Gothic should be like vanished. It didn't. Coleridge's remorse, for example, was staged in 1813, and as we've seen, Mrs. Bland's invocation was anything but frenetic or suspenseful. Kelly, however, did feel the need in that play to provide a more dramatic, chromatically varied and noisy number for the blacker charm. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> Despite that diminished seventh, Kelly was better at what Matthew Lewis called his beautiful music. <laughs> In 1807, he composed music for Lewis's The Wood Demon. The songs passed muster, but the melodramatic music was distinctly underwhelming. So when Lewis reworked the piece in 1811 as one o'clock, he got Matthew Peter King on board. In the new overture for the piece, King showed he knew what was required. This is music to get the adrenaline going. It's an unashamed succession of diminished seventh chords, augmented sixth, short phrases that suddenly end, sudden sandos, insistent repetition, violent contrast in volume, continual refusal to return to the tonic, and lots of disturbing tremolando thrown in for good measure. <laughs> approach to music could still be found in the popular operatic romances of the early 19th century. Thus, Horn and Graham's music for Samuel J. Arnold's The Devil's Bridge of 1812 has updated versions of the kinds of songs you might find in a 1790s Gothic drama. Love arias, numbers like, hark, it is the Vesper Bell, a hush-hush song, a hunting chorus, and a bravura number for the leading lady when, like a Radcliffe heroine, she sings, bright sun, I adore thee when rising sublime. <laughs> We're going to give you now the celebrated prison song, sung by Mr. Braham with universal applause. It was written by the leading man, John Braham himself. It's a substantial number in three sections that takes us through various aspects of the hero and his situation. The opening passage suggests the stern reality of imprisonment, which the hero faces with stoicism. As the instrumental accompaniment flutters behind him, his notes are long and firm. There's a nice bit of word painting with the echo motif and the stop at the word silence. The second section, the canzonetta, reveals the hero's sensibility his tenderness and sense of loss. In the last section, the hero hopes. And somewhat bizarrely for modern sensibilities, he looks forward not only to liberty and love, but hunting as well. <laughs> Listen for those imitative horn passages and the thrilling top note when he sings of mountains. Once more with freedom, let's try it 
can we draw? One, it's important to hear the music of Gothic drama. We think we know what it sounds like because we're used to a certain idea of Gothic music, but perhaps some of the music that you heard tonight didn't sound quite as you might have expected. Hearing their music can alter the way we understand Gothic plays. When we factor in Kelly's or Arnold's, Shields or Starace's music, we find that we're looking at something richer than what's been described as the drama of terror and tears. Restoring the music to Gothic plays means restoring the tenderness, comedy, religious expression, romance and merriment that are integral to them. Hearing the Gothic drama as well, I would argue, helps us to rethink the Gothic novel, to pay more attention to its music, to learn how to hear it, and to let what we hear affect our interpretations. I think that the music of the melodrama had the effect of changing the significance of music in Gothic literature for good or bad. On stage, in the novel, in popular culture more generally, Radcliffian musicality is doomed to disappear. No longer will heroes and heroines take a break and sing their way through their adventures. Instrumental music displaces vocal music. After a certain point, I'd say it was somewhere around 1820, new musical scenarios predominate in novels and short stories. Strange, non-diegetic music arises from the ground and characters doubt their sanity. Fiendish, non-existent organs are heard, born from desolate mountains on howling winds. Violins are possessed by the spirits of previous owners and drive people to suicide. Music boxes spontaneously play in deserted houses. After the melodrama attains its stranglehood, or even stranglehold, music in the Gothic loses its innocence. It's no longer associated with the world of romance. Henceforth, music in the Gothic becomes Gothic music, disturbing, eerie, uncanny. <laughs> 